Hey guys, welcome back. Well, this video dates back a couple of months. I was having trouble with my SET, the fan vibration problem, and so I had to set it on the shelf for a while. I had some good visibility at night, so I didn't want to waste that time. So I switched over to one of my refractors, the Explore Scientific 102, and did some imaging while I was playing with the SCT in the house. So I thought I'd share with you some of the things that I've done to the ED-102 and some of the images I took during that 10-day period. Let's get started. A couple of things that I wanted to improve with the ED-102. I've been having these embossed circular features in my flats from time to time. Now, I did a video on this some time back, and I showed that if you set your filter wheel to rotate in only one direction using the native driver that comes with the filter wheel, you can get around some of these problems, particularly if you have mounted filters. In my case, I've got unmounted filters, and so there's the additional problem that the filter can shift through the night as a telescope goes through different positions. And if the filters shift, it can create in your images this embossed circular feature. Now, one way around that, if you have the unmounted filters, is to get these Buckeye Stargazer 3D printed masks. They're designed for different filter wheels. So you look what kind of filter wheel you have, you pick the appropriate set of masks. And we'll take a look at these on the next slide, but they help to prevent the motion of the unmounted filters within the filter wheel holder. And that will also help to eliminate those 3D embossed features. Another thing that I'm trying to do is I make my setups more independent. I have basically made the SCT an independent setup with its own camera, its own filter drawer. I have one power box that's shared between all three refractors, but I'm making some other changes so it makes it easier to move that power box between the three refractors. And once again, Buckeye Stargazer has this bracket that's designed for the Pegasus Astro lineup of power boxes and other manufacturers as well. And you can use this to attach it in a very secure way to your setup and also make it easier to move from one setup to the next. So thankfully, my SCT had its own setup and I could quickly bring in the ED-102 for some quick imaging so I didn't lose those consecutively clear nights that I had when I was messing around with the SCT. This is my ZWO filter wheel. Obviously, I've got the cover off and you can see these ribs here in the cover that stiffen up the cover. Now, the problem with the ZWO filter wheel, and maybe other filter wheels as well, is that they are designed to be very thin so they don't take up much optical length in your optical train. And one of the problems I have had with another filter I bought for this filter wheel, a mounted filter, that rim on the filter was just a little too high and it was getting caught against these ribs in the filter wheel cover. So that's a problem. And that's why when I upgraded the filters to the Antlia set of filters from my original ZWO set of mounted filters, I went with the unmounted filters so that I wouldn't have this problem of those filters getting caught on the internal ribs of the cover. Now the filter masks that come with the CWO filter wheel are just very thin masks that prevent the filter from popping out of the cover. They don't prevent the unmounted filter from shifting back and forth within the opening there. These Buckeye Stargazer filter masks come in. As you can see here, it's got this rib, this little recessed area here. Once you've screwed these things down, the filter cannot move. It's held very securely, regardless of what orientation the telescope takes throughout the night. And as a result, with this combined with the union, setting the unidirectional motion of the filter wheel, it keeps you from having those 3D artifacts. Another thing that I'm trying to do, since I do use this Pegasus Astro Ultimate power box with all three of my refractors. My SCT has its own power box, but I moved this particular power box from one refractor to the other. And what I need is a secure way of holding this power box and also simultaneously being able to quickly release and reinstall the power box on a different refractor. Now, as you can see here, I've got this L-shaped bar. I've got a Vixen, little short Vixen bar here that's held in with a quarter 20 socket head screw. And then I've got this Vixen base here that attaches to this bracket, which in turn holds the ultimate power box. These four screws here go inside these four corners and very securely hold the power box to this bracket that Buckeye Stargazer offers for this power box. But you also get a choice of how you want to mount the bracket to your hardware. And in this case, since I had this little Vixen bar standing by, I just chose the Vixen attachment that they have here. These four screws bolt this part onto the back side of the bracket, as you can see here, and then you can just tighten that down and you're good to go. And when I want to move this to a different refractor, I just undo this little screw here, 
take it over and put it on the similar bracket that's on each of my other two refractors. And in this way, I can very quickly uh, shift the hardware or this ultimate power box and all the cables over to another refractor. And I don't have to worry about the Velcro attachment coming loose during the night that I had been using up until now. And then there's a third change. So I've been using the ZWO off-axis guider with my ZWO ASI 290 mini guide cam on all three of my refractors. Well, going forward, I'm going to keep the off-axis guider here mounted on the ED-102, and I'm going to switch over to the William Optics Uniguide 50 and use that with my Redcat 51 and my William Optics GT81. Well, that means I need a new guide camera. Turns out ZWO has come out with a new guide camera. In fact, they've replaced the ASI 290 with the, this ASI 220. This guide camera has a slightly larger sensor than the 290, so I'm going to use the ASI 220 in the ZWO off-axis guider and just move my ASI 290 over to the William Optics Uniguide 50 with my other two refractors. And then that way, it'll once again cut down on the amount of equipment that I've got to move from one setup to the other. During that unexpected period of downtime for my SCT, I was able to shoot three different targets. One of them was the so-called Little Rosette Nebula. This is the first time I've shot this target. I didn't find this target to be particularly interesting, frankly. It doesn't have the color, it doesn't have the detail, it doesn't have the size of the true Rosette Nebulas. Probably wouldn't go back and shoot this target again. The second target, which I also had never shot before, is the Wizard Nebula. Now, this is definitely a great target. It's got a lot of great blue to it, oxygen, and it's got a lot of great detail that you get from the hydrogen alpha, of course, and the sulfur. So this is a really nice target. I might actually go back to this target with my SCT with the focal reducer in place, and that would probably give me a very close-up view of this area here. And then finally, I went over to the North American Nebula, NGC 7000. And as you many of you know, there's the Cygnus Wall Nebula, which is just a part of the North American Nebula. I had shot the North American Nebula with my Red Cat 51. It's a large target, but it has lots of good oxygen sulfur and hydrogen alpha so it makes a really nice and easy target to process in the SHO palette. With the ED-102 I just wanted to go back and focus in on the Cygnus wall and get a little more detail on this small section of that very large nebula. So all in all I had 10 consecutive clear nights and was able to knock out three emission nebula. I'll give you a closer look at each one of these pictures at the end of the video. Well, I had an opportunity to quickly push my ED-102 back into service when my SCT came down with a bad bout of fan vibration. So I've reported on having some flats artifacts that look like embossed or 3D circles that are distributed around the field. This comes about for two reasons. One, because the filter wheel doesn't go back to the same place each time. That can cause a problem even if you have mounted filters in your filter wheel. But if you have unmounted filters in your filter wheel, you have a different potential problem, which is that there's a little bit of a gap between the filter and the circle hole, the circular hole that the filter fits in. And so that filter can shift back and forth as the telescope assumes different positions. Well, it turns out Buckeye Stargazer is making some 3D filter masks that hold those unmounted filters in place so that as your telescope moves and achieves different orientations, the filter doesn't have an opportunity to shift, and so you won't get these 3D artifacts in your pictures. Another thing that I wanted to do was to come up with a quick release, quick install solution for when I'm moving my Pegasus Astro Ultimate Power Box from one refractor to the other refractor. Well, it turns out Buckeye Stargazer makes a 3D printed plastic Ultimate Power Box. So that proves to be a very secure way of attaching the power box to your setup. Plus, it makes it very easy to quickly detach it and install it on a different setup. If you're not aware of Buckeye Stargazer's 3D printed plastic part lineup, you might go on to Agena Astro Products and look up all of the components that Buckeye Stargazer is making. You're very likely to find something useful on the website. And a third change, I've decided to take the CWO ASI 290 guide cam and pair it with the William Optics Uniguide 50, and I'll use that guide scope with my two short focal length refractors. Meanwhile, I'll keep the ZWO off-axis guider with the ED-102, and that's where I went to the new ZWO ASI-220. It's a little bit larger sensor than the ASI-290, 
and it's brand new, so you'll want to definitely download and update your ZWO drivers if you haven't done that recently. Now, something else I found that I had to do was to download the latest development snapshot of PHD2. So I went from baseline version 2.6.11 to 2.6.11 uh, development snapshot 6. Okay, guys, well, that's all I've got here. Stay tuned for the images, and I'll talk to you later. See ya. Thank you.